Check, check. Check, check. All right, great. So hi, I'm uh, Isaac Kohane, Zach Kohane. I'm the uh, chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School. Uh, I'm the chair of the I2B2 uh, Foundation and also editor-in-chief of uh, NEGM AI. And I am functioning now as the foil to Chris White. Chris White, we are very fortunate to have uh, with us today because he's a busy man. He is a um, head of the head of a whole bunch of special projects at Microsoft Research, and his interests are very, very broad. But unlike some people with broad interests, where it's just a manifestation of ADHD, his um, broad interests actually have resulted in many spectacular and important um, implementations, ranging from um, serious proof of concepts of underwater data centers cooled by water to being in Afghanistan and figuring out what certain dangerous people are doing based on a variety of uh, data sets and everything that you can imagine uh, beyond. And so as a result, he has touched all the way from his work back in DARPA, all the way now to his leadership roles at Microsoft Research in projects that um, would seem very familiar to many people in this room. So one of the themes of I2B2, one of the reasons that I2B2 happened in the first place when with Sean Murphy, we wrote the, the first uh, proposal back in 2004, is we wanted healthcare systems to be able to use the, their electronic health record data for their own intelligence, whether for discovery research, for quality improvement, for, for population management. And back in uh, December 2022, it um, became clear that uh, there was a new opportunity to use large data sets for these purposes, and that was to apply these large language models for um, a variety of uh, projects. And certainly the EHR vendors, notably uh, Epic, has been eyeing this, and not only just eyeing this, have been involved closely with Microsoft now for a couple of years in trying to understand how this works. And so I thought that with Chris's permission, we would explore what it takes and how institutions should think about this uh, challenge. And so that I know you're gonna have a lot of questions and let me take my iPhone out so that I give us no more than 25 minutes. So I'm gonna give you the remaining between 25 minutes and this end of this session to ask questions. So I will, in 25 minutes, you can start asking questions. So be prepared to grab the microphone because I know there will be a lot of questions. So Chris, before I start shaping the discussion in the way that you know that I, <laughs> that I will, could you just comment about what you're just seeing in terms of demand or questions mm. um, from, you, talk, talk, you touch a lot of the parts of the industry. Are you seeing a lot of hospitals saying, hmm, what are we gonna do about this? Or mm. pharma, hmm, what are we gonna do about this? Yeah, great, great question. First, maybe just a um, quick un, un, for, informal survey. Uh, how many of you, uh, somebody in the household is using some kind of generative AI 
GPT-4, any of these co-pilots, is this a common thing for all of you or not a common thing? Journey of AI used to have you, have you used a co-pilot and like asked some things? Yeah. So most people. Okay. I, I have a qu another question. How many of you or your family are using it at least once a day? Yeah, regularly. Okay. And even better. How many of you are, are paying for at least one account? Yeah. Are paying for it? Okay. How many of you are paying for two? <laughs> Okay, so so it's about half half the people in the room are paying for an account. You know, three quarters are are testing one, using one. Um, how many of you have read Zach's book? Yeah. Okay, well that should be everybody, obviously, in the future, next time. Next time. Uh, all, all kidding aside, uh, I ask these questions because there's a wide range of perspective on what is generative AI, how does it relate to medicine and healthcare, how what is the state of the art, how fast is it moving, does it matter to me? It matters to me, I'll tell you, because now if I go to a doctor for, especially my kids, uh, I, I, I spend some time with the AI first. And if my doctor hasn't, then that's a problem. And so in the last panel we talked about, I heard some issues around risk, risk of privacy, risk of disclosure, legal you know, alignment. Um, I, I'm worried about the risk of not having the right knowledge at the time of care. Um, and that's my concern as a, as a, as a patient. Um, I'm, I'm a patient, I'm not a, not a doctor. However, I have to say that we just had a conference in uh, Puerto Rico. Um, it's an annual conference around AI. And we invited a mom and her kid and a neurosurgeon. The mom, three years ago, noticed that her kid was having trouble walking then having trouble uh, chewing and then was having headaches that just did not go away, incapacitating headaches. She went to doctor after doctor, doctor, got studies, MRIs, the brain, spinal cord, all, everything. Nothing was helping. And in fact, what always happens eventually when we don't have answers started happening, whereas, which is the doctor started suggesting that she go to a psychiatrist with her child. Instead, she took all the reports and she poured it into GPT-4 and said, what's wrong with my kid? And GPT-4 said, I'm not a doctor, but most likely, given these, this history, is tethered cord syndrome, which is the spinal cord ends in a sort of ponytail of fibers and it can get trapped by the bones in the spine. So she goes to a doctor who happens to be an African-American uh, neurosurgeon in Michigan in an underserved area. And she says, is this, does my child have tethered core syndrome? And the surgeon, neurosurgeon picks up the MRI and looks at it and says, yep. <laughs> and then they do surgery and the kid's fine. And what a number of things went wrong including, and this happens in medicine all the time, no one went back to the original image. So the image was mis misinterpreted and people just looked at the report. Mm -hmm. Yet there was enough information collectively mm -hmm. that GPT-4 said, this is tethered cord. Mm -hmm. And I want you to realize that in Massachusetts, when my faculty come uh, in my department from that uh, feeder school, what's it called? Uh, Stanford. <laughs> um, and they say, Zach, um, I would like to have primary care. To make a long story short, I, I've given up now. MGB, our largest healthcare system, all the primary care practices are not accepting new patients. All my friends who are in primary care either have closed their practices or have, or have retired. You can't get primary care. So there's a huge gap. And so what Chris is saying is absolutely um, the case. Now, he nerds not me because I wasn't going to talk about that, but <laughs> I think it's perhaps the most important aspect of these models is in a healthcare system that is stumbling, mm -hmm. providing patients um, a, with a second opinion. Mm -hmm. But let's get back on, on track here. So we have these systems. Yeah. That, the demand. Let me talk about the demand, right? Right, right. So, so also you mentioned, you mentioned both ends, though. You mentioned there, there's the high end of the complex cases. And then there's the the low end of just you have no access to medical care, and 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 somehow these models are providing support to experts on on, on both ends. 
without any specialization. And that's a discovery. Um, and so when you talk about the demand for that discovery, uh, just last week, uh, for a day, maybe uh, maybe this earlier earlier this week, in the last week, um, NVIDIA crossed Microsoft as being the most valuable company in the world. Temporarily. That, temporarily. Because obviously, you know, Microsoft is to Harvard in this analogy as Stanford is to NVIDIA. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but but all kidding aside, uh, this is a you know a chip maker who's the most valuable company in the world, and why 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 is that? Why is NVIDIA worth three trillion dollars? Um, and then why is Microsoft number two? And then and then how come Amazon is so close? Uh, the the demand for these models um, is outpacing everything, absolutely everything, in, in every direction, in every area: law, medicine, finance, um, education. Uh, work workplace productivity. And so we're early, it's still very early in this uh, discovery process. Um, but, you know, both Zach and I are, are researchers and that makes us, you know, we, we see research when it's happening and, and, and we're all now kind of researchers because these are, are becoming available capabilities all the time, uh, personally and, and within enterprises. And, and no one knows how they work exactly. And no one knows how reliable they are exactly. And, and all of you uh, have the, the grounding of your, your, your local systems, the data, and the uh, doctors and nurses who are experts. And so you have the environment for determining, is this worthwhile? Um, is it useful to my patients? Um, how can my um, experts provide validation and, and verification? And, and tech companies don't have any of that. You know, we, we partner with Epic, we partner with uh, Providence, we partner with other healthcare systems, uh, but all of you are, are, you know, as you said, someone earlier in the, in the panel, you deal with overlapping patients, you deal with, you know, known populations, uh, you deal with the long, longevity of your, of your systems. And all of that expertise is not in these models yet. And so finding the way to bridge the gap between your expertise and your, your access with these general capabilities is one of the big questions of right now. So uh, last year, to entertain these folks, I um, went against a database I had never explored, mm -hmm. which was basically containing a zip file from the from the FDA. And it was all the adverse re event reporting. Mm -hmm. And I started asking queries and GPT-4 started essentially doing joins mm -hmm. to be able to answer this question and showed that how could take this large database and provide this um, increased access. But there's the other side of the use of this data is patients and are different in every healthcare system, what the case mix is, and the practice of medicine is different. So if you are a hospital, there are a couple of ways, more than a couple of ways that you can start thinking about how to use your data to improve your care, to improve your research, to improve the patient experience. One way is just to say, I'm gonna go with one of the frontier models from Microsoft or Google or Anthropic, and um, I'm going to figure out a way to have HIPAA compliant connections between my data, my patient data, my questions, and those sites. Another way is to say, I'm gonna take either one of those proprietary models and figure out how to get permission to run it locally or to take an open source model and uh, run it locally. And then using either in, in context learning that's in the prompt or fine tuning, um, where you're actually changing some layers of the, of the model uh, to make it be more customized to your experience. How is, from your perspective, is this question being approached by different groups? Hmm. Oh, it's a great and hard question. And, and the assumption behind it is that the asset, uh, the data, you know, provide the value. Uh, for your, you know, local administration of, of healthcare and medicine. And the question is how, you know, how is it best used? Um, and this is where, again, everyone's a researcher a little bit. I mean, the state of the art, you, you could ask a different way. It's what is the most accurate situation, the most accurate model? And, and, and so most accurate in this case maybe is defined right now by 
uh, a mix of the, the largest frontier models with a bunch of clever prompting strategies, uh, but maybe it's also very expensive and maybe it's also out of compliance with some of your requirements. And so maybe accuracy for US medical licensing exam type questions is not your the, the, the criteria you care about. Uh, maybe you care about cost or latency or privacy or compliance. Um, and so there's this, these different tensions between what is valuable, what is um, you know, th the best. Um, and, and so in a way, all of you being a data-oriented people, you're very used to metrics. Um, and, and so I think that in, in the panel that follows this, you'll find also expertise around different kinds of evaluation. Evaluation with doctors in the loop, evaluation with uh, rare diseases versus uh, common diseases. And, and I would say that that framework of benchmarking and validation with experts in the loop is an important framework for every hospital system. Um, that right now, to expect that it's given out of the box, kind of like working, is, is just not quite where the technology seems to be, but that's where it's moving toward. And, and so anybody that has a, a data asset um, and has experts, I think needs to be in the evaluations conversation and the evaluations framework conversation. Now, that being said, you mentioned a few ways of approaching the use of your private data. You can train your own model, you can um, update a known model, you can augment a known model. And, and, and these are different uh, approaches to using the private data. And right now, what we see are people pursuing all of them in parallel. Um, they, they require different resourcing. Uh, to train your own model means you need to have GPUs and some smarts in that way. To update a model means you also need to have some GPUs and some smarts in that way. To augment a model means you just need to have some databases and some traditional ecosystem technologies and so there's different barriers to entry, different costs for operations, different sense of, of maintainability. Let me ask a very um, um, tactical question, which mm -hmm. I've seen has come up in many healthcare systems. Is there a way to access a frontier model like GPT-4 that would meet HIPAA compliance mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the data, where the data yeah. goes and how, yeah. who sees it? So like the, one of the panelists last time, I'll, I'll call my lawyers to the table. Um, I, I don't know the specific answer to like generally available access through HIPAA compliant Azure architectures, but I can tell you that that is the, certainly the goal of the large companies. Like at Microsoft, one of the models of Microsoft is it runs on trust. And that means that there's a premium placed on um, you know, user control, data control, uh, transparency, uh, compliance within different uh, sovereign regimes like countries, uh, states, and then local policies. This is a huge uh, challenge, whether it's um, medical you know, or finance or government, many of the same kinds of questions. How do I operate with those guarantees? And so uh, Azure, Microsoft Cloud has as a priority enabling access with those guarantees. And I'd say in a way that's the current big difference between signing up directly to open AI and signing up through Azure is that you get all of those managed services. Um, and for a lot of organizations, that's really important because they um, need to be audible, they have to be scrutable, and they have to be uh, compliant. Um, so I think that the answer is yes, my, but I don't know 100% today if you could go sign up right now and have that work. I know through Epic, there's also a variety of offerings and also through uh, what used to be Nuance, um, through like their, their, their uh, technology as well. Is there any evidence that we can make the small models perform better? Oh yeah, this is one of the areas of new research is how well can these small models do? Uh, there used to be this perspective on the scaling of the size of the model was the most important way that you get higher performance, but now they're finding through distillation is what it's called, essentially smarter, better training data that you can get a lot of what you want in, in a smaller package. And, uh, Microsoft has these models called Phi that that demonstrate that, and um, at the same time, you know, you could ask in general, besides you know reasoning, you know, what are these models useful for? And, and it turns out there's quite a lot of interesting things. Like there's 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 this discussion around models becoming more like a universal um, ability to, to create structure in data, um, and creating structure allows you to do abstract thinking. Um, you can do translation, which means that from one language space, like a ontological structure to another, you, you can 
You can create bridges. Um, it also allows you to do annotation for things that you care about that then be part of benchmarking or, or even reasoning to check like how steps of thinking are working and to create hypotheses or create validation and testing. So these are things that are surprising and they're not part of the old ML regime, not part of the old statistical approach to machine learning, but this uh, transformer-based approach really creates these opportunities. And the, the small models, they're also, you know, again, private and, and, and cheaper. And so I, I'd say that the, the most common thing I hear for, for systems that are exploring this decision space is how do I manage risk? Um, and, and there's different kinds of risk. And, and what I'm hearing is that this interaction between small models and large models is where a lot of risk mitigation is occurring. The large models, maybe they tell you what the highest performance you might expect to see is. And maybe that helps you determine in your own system the kinds of inputs and outputs that you really want to have in a recurring fashion for all of your workflows. But on the, on the other hand, the small models let you test things very cheaply. And so you can explore a space very quickly without incurring a high cost. And so I'm, I'm hearing that organizations are are having a, a mixed approach of, of going back and forth between testing some things with frontier models that are managed and then testing some things in small models. You, it, you correctly pointed out that on the fine tuning small model side, you have to have your own GPUs and mm -hmm. then um, uh, modifying larger models, you also have the GPUs and also in both cases, mm -hmm. uh, some technical expertise, mm -hmm. perhaps less so in the large model. Mm -hmm. In the early days of I2B2, um, there was a similar kind of uh, thought about which hospitals or groups had the technical expertise mm -hmm. to install and, and do the ETL, the data loading from the electronic health record into um, the, these uh, dimensional data repositories. But it turned out that the market mm -hmm. quickly generated a few companies mm -hmm who work in this space. Are there already companies now mm -hmm. that are coming to hospitals and say, we have access to the GPUs, mm -hmm. we have access to the expertise, and we can help you roll slash modify your own? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, which is a challenge actually. I don't know about you, but the kind of like hype wave of, of people pushing, uh, you know, we have the answer. It's like happening all the time, and they're using all the same words, um, you know, about different kinds of AI, different kinds of um, expectations and experiences. Um, and, and there's like all these different layers of, of organizations on top of Azure and, and Amazon, on, on top of OpenAI, um, you know, and that's great because I think that it's creating an environment where organizations who have the data assets and who have the expertise for determining value uh, can arbitrage across all of these organizations trying to sell them stuff. Um, in the end, in the end, no one is going to do that evaluation for you, uh, whether it's a performance or a cost or a, or a relationship and a complexity. And so I think in a way that the market is, is actually rising, there's more and more small companies and medium-sized companies that are um, having that domain expertise in healthcare or in medicine, and they're trying to bridge the gap between the, the general you know, technology capability, and then the kind of in-situ you know, delivery of care. Um, you know, not just like you know, Epics and Cerner's, but also lots of lots of smaller companies. And maybe some of them are, are in here that are interested in. Any any company that I know that's interested in data these days has like half of their eye looking at generative AI. It has like a future evolution kind of already like in, in the thought process, just because there, there is a, a real change in capability. Uh, there is a real uh, discovery. Like the AI hype wave has happened maybe many times in the last 50 years. Uh, I've, I've seen a couple of them in, in, in my career. Um, but I will say that when these models came out, when, when Zach started writing his book, uh, it was the first time I started seeing some of them. Um, it was such a surprise that I, you know, I took my whole uh, research organization and everybody stopped what they were doing. And, and we all shifted our attention and started moving in this direction, all, all of us. Um, because even if you were an expert in AI, uh, the context shift was so important. Uh, whether you were a cryptographer or an economist uh, or did graph theory or, or a socio-technical researcher, uh, you had to be AI aware if you wanted to be relevant in the next three years. And so the timetable is also fast. The speed is very fast, um, which is exciting because 
that means all of these people, all these companies that are building these capabilities are going to be coming to all of you who have, uh, you know, who can purchase, who have assets, who can create value and, and, and demonstrate that this versus that is better. When you said the value that uh, triggered another thought in me, for a long time, I've seen many healthcare systems that had at the back of their mind that somehow they were going to monetize their data. And um, that hasn't worked out so far. But at the same time, just reading the headlines, I'm seeing that um, there's a bunch of investments that the larger companies are making in data sources like Reddit mm -hmm. and so on. From your perspective, is it likely that the monetization path will continue to be more of a distraction slash mirage? Mm -hmm. And how, how should healthcare systems be thinking about their data? in terms of an, as an asset for uh, AI applications. Mm. Yeah, I was not thinking about monetization. I was thinking about value in the sense of care, um, in the sense of total cost of care, in the sense of personalization of care, and reducing the variance in care. I was thinking of that kind of value. Um, I tend to be a bit shy about monetizing uh, personal information of one kind or another, um, in my, as you mentioned, some of my background, I, I've seen the power that that has. You know, whatever the process is you're observing, whatever complex process, whether it's, um, you know, a person trying to do something harmful in, in the world, like a, a terrorist, or whether it's a, a patient trying to understand a very complex situation in their family, um, you know, there is this process of what is observable. You know, what is observable over the period that you care about, and then how can you integrate those observations to understand what's going on for the right intervention so that you can move forward. And uh, that process, you know, you could ask what processes are, are changing fast, which means they're, they're slow. You know, the number of people is changing slow. The, 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 the people getting sick is kind of the same. The, the technology has changed really fast and the laws are changing super slow. And at some point it's possible that the laws could change which would also affect questions of value and monetization and shareability. And so I think that there's a kind of something wrapped together between you know, monetization, uh, regulation, um, value, and, and sort of technical readiness. Um, and I say right now, it, it appears that the technology is pretty good at, at, at showing a new kind of value in existing information. And that creates a lot of opportunity. Um, but I'd also say that it's really early still. Um, there's still lots of surprise, like the upper bound on these models has not been seen yet. There is no upper bound yet on the largest model, on, on, on what kind of capabilities emerge. At, at some size of model, it went from not knowing humor to knowing humor. Why is humor a capability that a large language model has, has evolved to learn? It's a very surprising capability that wasn't trained for. And so there's a bunch of these questions that are still early on, which also point at uh, value and, and monetizability. Maybe, maybe one more non-answer to your question. Um, if you just zoom ahead, like not that far, 18 months, you know, 24 months, uh, you know, GPT-5 comes out, maybe another Claude version comes out. Maybe there's something that's even more integrated with modalities like vid video and imagery. And maybe it's also at a different operating point with latency. Maybe it's Real time. Now, now a real time video based AI that's as capable as GPT 4 on text will, will change the entire landscape again on what data are valuable, what you monitor as part of the process of observing a complex issue, um, how you uh, monetize going forward. And so, again, those organizations that are you know, steeped in um, you know, data collection you know, data management uh, and the integration of data into service systems, I think are in a good, good position to, to realize that. So contrary to appearances, the reason I brought up monetization, you, you were very clear that you were talking about value. The reason I used that opportunity to talk about monetization was in fact, to circle back to the mass CPR question. Mm -hmm. um, 
which is the perception that there is um, financial value has historically been an impediment mm -hmm. to data sharing mm -hmm. because somehow we're letting the 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 jewels out of the out of the uh, institutions where by the way it's not clear to me that ultimately the patients don't actually own that financial value mm -hmm. but regardless i think mm -hmm. that now looking at people here in the room there is a real value proposition around data sharing and having completeness that these machine learning models uh, will thrive on. And, um, and so hopefully we're gonna focus on the value and not necessarily the monetization. I, I'm just curious, how many of you in the audience uh, at the corporate level, at the so institutional level, are using frontier models like Gemini, GPT-4, uh, Claude? A small handful. How many of you are using uh, your own or open source or small models? Wow, okay. So what I conclude for that is the majority of audience are not actually using uh, the models yet against their own data. Mm -hmm and are mostly just using the existing models with it, whatever corp, uh, mm -hmm. corpus have, has trained them. So. Because there is like a, a category thing there, right? At least in, in most corporate environments, there's like a, a power that be that says thou shalt have access to data or technology or not, yeah. and under what circumstances. And uh, in some places I've seen a lot of shyness around especially sending sensitive information into an API that's going to a tech company and knowing what does that mean and is that trustworthy? Is it, is it aligned with my own uh, corporate corporate policies? Um, it's, it's a challenge. And that's why, that's why I asked first at the beginning, people that are using it at home, because that's what I'm seeing is people are doing it anyway. Um, they're just doing it at home while their companies catch up uh, for what's working. So, you know, one among the many, many accomplishments and uh, stages of life that uh, Chris went through, I didn't mention the fact that he was a postdoc at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences here, and by the way, still lives in, in Cambridge. And yet at that very same School of Engineering and Applied Science and at Harvard University, they are scared and they are not willing yet to embrace this uh, fully because they don't understand it. And this, but there's something a little bit odd about that in my mind because we use search engines like Google all the time and we're stuffing all sorts of private information into it without any representation that Google is not going to uh, use any of that, of that data. So we're in this weird uh, uh, interim stage where because it's new, we have, or being, I think reasonably uh, uh, fastidious about where the data goes, but in many other parts of our corporate lives, we're not being uh, that fastidious. Mm -hmm. I promised you that we would uh, leave time for questions. And so it's not often that we have a Chris uh, White here. So um, I'd like to invite some questions. Yeah, or critiques. Or critiques, and I see Sean has raised his hand, which is great. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic uh, discussion. Um, so I guess my question is gonna be around the use of AI in our everyday lives. So it used to be that, you know, if you didn't have this thing called a library, you were lost, right? And nowadays, we don't really have libraries anymore. And so in terms of our, is it gonna get to the point where if we don't have AI readily available, are we gonna be lost? Mm. And you know, I turn to Apple, right? So mm. Apple's now kind of capitalizing on this mm. in that, look, we're going to cater to your individual needs through AI. And at the same time, 
is this going to make our whole kind of social media situation worse, right? In that we already have ourselves on Google and Facebook mm. and everything else that exists, right? And in this case, we're going to territory we don't even understand mm -hmm. about how what we release mm -hmm. might be incorporated. And, and unfortunately, that's exactly what happened with a lot of things that were on Google that got put into these huge compendiums of training data, right? Mm -hmm. What's this new world going to come to? And how does medicine actually fit into this in terms of navigating privacy versus knowledge? Well, it's a hard question. You know, part of the hardness of it is that, uh, you know, in a way, AI is not one thing anymore. You know, it's like a multifaceted thing. You know, I mean, people use analogies because it's so complicated. And so they analogize like, well, it could be like electricity, you know, it powers everything. Or it could be like fire, where once it's independently discovered, you can't control it. It can be trained. Anybody can do it. There's nothing secret about that. There's a transformer and there's data and you kind of turn, turn the cranks. Um, and and you know these these fears have also gone back you know all the way to the you know uh, Gutenberg Bible and the, and the printing press and Socrates and, and people's fear of of writing as a you know a, being able to like lose your memory you know you can't remember anything you have to write it all down and and so you know again these are all um, you know uh, perspectives on change and fear and when there's a discovery process the newness confronts us with our habits. And so there's this kind of daily perspective on, am I gonna be lost without AI? Well, I'm lost without AI on my phone, like the map. I use the map to get here. I mean, I live here, but the map with the traffic and all that's pretty critical for me. And when it's not working, I have a really tough time getting on time to the right place. Um, does that mean I'm not a good driver? Or I don't know where I'm going, you know, it doesn't. Um, and then on the other you know, kind of extreme, you have, you know, you have big concerns about, uh, does medicine, can we create progress in medicine in terms of medical knowledge? Uh, can we create progress in access to medicine, you know, through the exponential scaling of, of, of you know, technology as, as information reaches people? And so I'm not, you know, uh, a government official, and, and there are people in positions of authority who need to be carefully bring together perspectives and navigating these uh, issues very carefully. Um, but I would say I'm I'm bringing the perspective of of the of the edge of the capability, you know, of, of the state of the art, and, and the state of the art is, frankly, shocking now, that that the same model without any specialization that was just trained to predict the next word can pass the bar exam, the medical licensing exam, you know, can can translate my, you know, random yoga question, you know, through Sanskrit in write it in a way that I understand. I mean, all, all kinds of things are, are kind of surprising at the moment. And, and therefore, I think it's important that, that people, you know, come together and, and use their socio structures, you know, to help um, adjudicate uh, different um, ambiguities. That in the end, the, the, the kind of automation versus augmentation question is gonna get supported by people making decisions. And so that's why, I'm, I come to things like this. That's why when Zach said, come, I said, absolutely. Because I find that talking to a lot of people, talking to faculty at MIT and Harvard, there's a variance in what does the AI models do? Are they good? Are they risky? Should I be using them? Are my students gonna be using them? Um, how can I prevent my students from using them? Um, or how can I use them to grade my students? Um, you know, and those are really talented technical people who are in the discipline. You know, much less my sister who is a English professor same questions about her students. And then, or my wife who teaches in the business school, you know, to prepare for her cases in teaching. And so I say in a way, these are important questions to be having an informed conversation about. And so I wanna to come to places like this and at least put my point of view on, you know, motivating getting informed, which means like downloading, you know, messing with it yourself, doing experiments, you know, being a little bit of a research mind person for a little while, and then, at a corporate level, having a point of view about what to do, um, not reacting only and not waiting for someone to sell you something only. I think I think that's, thank you for that question. I just want to quickly add that. I think from the perspective of medicine, the fact that a whole range of patients will be doing exactly what Chris is doing means that 
it's going to be an existential question for medicine. If our patients are, are getting instant second opinions, which they will when, when, when things are fine, they may not. When things are not going well, they will ask. And we'll have to start dealing with both the absolutely brilliant uh, inferences of these uh, mechanisms, but also when they go wrong, because our patients will be using them. They'll be using them, and they're using them now. Mm -hmm. I see we have another question. Um, I think it's called uh, direct consumer advertising. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Chris Connor uh, from Relinvent. Um, so my question is actually, actually dovetails uh, really, I think, nicely to, uh, to Sean's. Um, from a technology perspective, can you touch upon sort of the trends and where you think things are going for the autonomy, um, governance, and adjudication of these like mixed models where, you know, mixture of experts or um, large and small models, agents, wh where's, where's that governance, where's that control going to reside? Well, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, people say uh, a lot about hallucinations, for example, as like a concern around large language models um, or other kinds of like out of policy kinds of responses as like you know, concerns to, to mitigate. Um, and I think there's a, a wave of technologies that are coming that are trying to address those. I think there's better training data as one way they're being addressed, uh, better fine tuning, you know, better augmentation that would provide grounding. And at the same time, there's, you know, categories of models that are being trained just to do verification, you know, just to follow along and analyze the doctor, the patient, and the transcript and provide, you know, error correction. Um, even GPT can do some of those things, but there are other efforts that are that are designed to do that. I think there's, you know, further technology that will integrate into uh, these AI systems that will provide more grounding, um, whether it's uh, like logical systems or whether it's other kinds of systems that have guarantees about you know, different kinds of performance. Right now, it's still early days, and so these are emerging. But you mentioned you know, these are the right kind of dimensions, like governance and um, verification, validation. And at the same time, there, there right now isn't like a current silver bullet either. You know, there's a, a range of research approaches that people are taking to try to create more assurance you know, and more, more reliability. So do you think it's safe to say that it's the data? <laughs> it, <laughs> wah, well, wah. It, well, again, the, the, the data are amazing because they both provide the basis for reasoning and they can provide the grounding mm -hmm. for verification. Like in the output, you can start to force the model to mm -hmm. only say things if you can find a link all the way back through. And so this kind of grounded output or constrained decoding or like, logically consistent decoding. There's, there's a handful of approaches people are trying, but the data are the, the core of it. Yeah. It's just the, the different ways in which you want to enforce consistency, uh, grounding, um, repeatability within your own um, data and reasoning situation. Thanks, thank you. Our DPH colleague here. Thank you. So I have a question around uh, equity, vulnerable populations. Um, there's with, with sort of the publicly available uh, access to AI, have you started looking at, do you have any data on or, or just your own perspective on, will this uh, open or close uh, gaps in equity? Folks' ability to access uh, the, the, the value of these models, their ability to go through and, not, I'm not talking about the training and sort yeah. of doing complicated things, but more on kind of the uh, the more publicly available, ubiquitous yeah. AI. What what are you seeing, and what's your perspective on that? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think equity is a uh, top issue, at least in Microsoft around AI technologies, uh, both the responsibility side of that, like uh, mitigating bias that would disproportionately affect uh, vulnerable populations. And then also perspectives on access uh, to create ease of use um, and lower the friction so that non-traditional users uh, could perhaps benefit from new technologies. And they're both uh, important you know, considerations. Um, you know, I, a, a bigger answer to your question probably is a harder one around like systems of power 
because AI is a is increasing power among systems of power. And do those systems enfranchise or disenfranchise people? It's a, it's a harder question to answer. But from a consumer level, there's just no no questioning the fact that right now GPT 4.0 is free and has a medical perspective that you know you can't buy, really. You know, like in the sense of what you would normally want to ask a bunch of experts, you can start to now ask and get a first point of view. And so that is readily available. It doesn't mean it's meeting the vulnerable population where they are yet, uh, but we have other research, like my colleague, for example, Mary Gray, who's a, also in, in the area, amazing woman, MacArthur Fellow, um, writes about you know, these technologies and is currently doing these experiments with um, community-based health organizations as the bridge between um, commercial like EHR providers and then um, local you know, hospitals that they would go to as, as an experiment to see, well, is that a good mechanism for providing access to vulnerable populations? Because it provides some source of um, expertise and training and, and familiarity. And so there's a question institutionally, how do you support these emerging technologies, getting them to the people that need them in, in a place they can use them uh, where, where there is that kind of uh, mutual benefit? So again, I, I'd say, again, my, my bias is yes, there's a lot of opportunity for access and there's some questions around um, organizational mechanisms to, to make that a reality, um, including in, in, in the metro area here. Uh, but I think it requires, as again, administrators of these systems to have principles around what are they good for? You know, what kinds of value do we prioritize? Um, where, you know, that's an important consideration. Rare diseases is another important consideration. You know, how do we have that as a principle, you know, for enabling whatever the thing we're doing for everyone? I think I just want to add that when I hear that question, I always ask myself, compared to what? And again, in Boston, Massachusetts, there's huge inequities that are growing without AI and access to primary care. And if you want, and it's and the people who have money are now paying for concierge doctors. And that's widening, widening. And right now, things could change. So there, things could change. But access to expertise, even mid-level expertise, is actually decreasing for even solidly middle-class uh, patients. And so in some sense, this is an equalizer mm -hmm. because it allows you to go to your doctor with a sensible doctor speak mm -hmm. question it says mm -hmm. you, the report I got said this, but the AI says the following things are sometimes done instead. These are the interactions of the drug that I'm taking. That is something that is not captured anywhere currently in the healthcare system. So I always want to ask that question compared uh, compared to what? And in fact, there's a hypothesis that might be just as the uh, developing world leapfrogged past the developed world in telecommunications because they didn't have the sunk costs in all the uh, cable-based technology went straight to seller, there may be an mm -hmm. advantage for our underserved communities to actually leapfrog by our very stodgy, inert, uh, and uh, very hamstrung healthcare systems to actually provide a more flexible set of care. I think I have time. We have time for one question. I'll just add a comment while you're yeah. getting a question. You know, again, part of the surprise here, uh, OpenAI could have not released the model everywhere all at once. You know, the fact that these models are now everywhere all at once is a an unusual quirk of the way that they were created. They could have been kept private and then, you know, built up as a business. And this equity question would be a very different one. You know, oh, there's a special thing that's only over there that's very expensive to get, but it's very powerful and useful. Um, how can I make sure that it's fairly, you know, shared? Uh, instead, we, we have this wildfire and no one knows how to integrate it into the formal system. And now we're figuring it out. And that to me is a great like equalizer opportunity. Um, if there can be support, you know, to enable those people to use that in a legitimate way, um, 
And I don't think it takes much imagination to imagine the counterfactual, which is if that had been the way, if it had been not released broadly, for sure the medical establishment would prevent it from being uh, um, made available to patients out, out of a, a expressed concern for safety. Yeah. I think, uh, where's Diane? So let's Sorry. give a, a hand of applause for 